welcome once again to the Christian Thought Lecture Series held at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. We are pleased to have as our speakers two deans of American evangelicalism, Dr. Kenneth S. Conser and Dr. Carl F. H. Henry. In our first session, Dr. Conser gave us his thoughtful definition of what evangelicalism is. Moreover, he provided us with his perceptions of important turning points in the story of evangelicalism. In this session, Dr. Carl F. H. Henry will also tell the story of American evangelicalism from the perspective of his very knowledgeable insider position. In future sessions, Dr. Donald A. Carson will engage Dr. Conser and Dr. Henry in what promises to be a lively question and answer exchange regarding evangelicalism's past, present, and future. Our second speaker then is Dr. Carl F. H. Henry. Dr. Henry received two doctorates, one from Northern Baptist Theological Seminary and the other from Boston University. He taught at Northern Baptist Theological Seminary and at Fuller Theological Seminary before becoming editor of Christianity Today. Like Dr. Conser, Dr. Henry is a person to whom both the secular and Christian media turn when they want to have an evangelical perspective on the news. A former newspaper man himself, Dr. Henry is indeed a very quotable person. Dr. Henry is presently a representative of Prison Fellowship Ministries founded by Chuck Colson. Let us also give a warm welcome to Dr. Carl F.H. Henry. In reflecting on 50 years or so of American evangelicalism, I propose to discuss the remarkable resurgence of, of biblical Christianity, to evaluate the present condition of the evangelical movement, to indicate some forfeited opportunities and to suggest ways into the future that seem important and even urgent in view of the present crisis in Western culture. Before I do so, however, let me first say a word about my colleague on this panel, Dr. Kenneth Conser, an esteemed friend of over 30 years. To his vision, the nation owes the existence of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, with 1,300 enrolled students and 4,600 alumni serving worldwide on every continent. In providing a platform for elder statesmen, it is understandable that the younger generation may perceive them as but talking heads. Since transition to future leadership tends to fall quickly upon more youthful shoulders. But an important observation must be made. The older generation has usually launched new enterprises and often preserved them well. The younger generation faces the tendency of diluting them for the sake of promotional or statistical prominence, sometimes blurring even core doctrines to the applause of a mediating generation of scholars. It is precisely Dr. Conser's stand for the truthfulness of scripture, for the importance of a full-orbed Christian world life view, and for bold fulfillment of Christ's missionary mandate in our pluralistic society that has made Trinity a significant factor in American Christianity. Our century has comprised one of the most dramatic turning and churning times in the history of humanity. Nowhere in the religious history of the West have the control beliefs of society changed 
as swiftly and as radically as in our 20th century struggle between theism and naturalism. That is, between the view that the universe owes its being to a supernatural creator and judge, and the contrary view that existence as a whole is reducible to impersonal processes and events. At the beginning of our century, modernism or liberal theology co-opted religious colleges and seminaries, publishing houses, denominational bureaucracies, and churches. Modernism was Christianity restated and tapered to the modern mind. Moses and Jesus were made acceptable to the prejudices of modernity. Modernism rejected the Edenic fall and the sinfulness of man and promoted an optimistic view of society, one that dispensed with Christ's propitiatory death for sinners and his bodily resurrection and final return. Instead of offering new birth by the Spirit of God, it claimed that mankind could overcome inner personality discord and tension and gain balanced selfhood simply by following Jesus in unbending devotion to the Father's will. In its view, human beings can achieve world brotherhood and social utopia, the kingdom of God, through education, legislation, and socialization, that is, economic redistribution. Modernism's deepest assumption was that the scientific method of laboratory duplication and verification is the supremely reliable way of knowing. This presupposition struck at the very heart of miraculous supernaturalism, of miraculous revelation, miraculous atonement, miraculous resurrection. It allowed no credibility to any event claim that could not be duplicated. No historical act was to be admitted as credible unless it occurred at least twice, the second time at a command performance by the modern observer. <laughs> Evangelical orthodoxy, with its emphasis on the once for all virgin birth of Christ, his substitutionary atonement and bodily resurrection was accordingly declared to be unscientific and pre-scientific. Modernism abandoned to so-called fundamentalists the great creedal beliefs of biblical Christianity. And the task of world evangelism, centering in the gospel that Christ died for sinners and lives as the risen Lord, and final judge of history. In this atmosphere, many of us fought our first battles for the Christian faith against modernism's assault on transcendent divine revelation and redemption. If we who had come to faith in Christ were deplored as fundamentalists, clinging to Christian basics now considered untenable, the modernists were soon themselves assailed for intellectual compromises of their own. How could modernists, in view of their emphasis on empirical confirmation and revisability, be so certain that psychological wholeness was a byproduct assured by following Jesus alone, and not Buddha as well? or even by devotion to humanitarian social service. To be sure, fresh headwinds were blowing from Europe. The continental theologians have never had a shortage of new theories. With neo-orthodoxy at a high, Karl Barth confidently pronounced modernism dead. Retaining some elements of the Christian tradition, while discarding others, 
he and his disciple Emil Brunner now promulgated the view that the future of Christian theology lies with our faith response to divine paradox and to non-intellective ongoing divine revelation to which, take it from Bart and Brunner, the Bible had suddenly begun witnessing. Whatever may be said for neo-orthodoxy and the ready welcome it received from compromising religious colleges and mediating seminaries, the large secular universities had little enduring interest in it. By a sounder instinct than that of many ecumenically minded churchmen, the secular philosophers realized that the ultimate tension of faith really centers between a merely mythological deity and a God who intelligibly makes known his word and his will. Bard insisted that supernatural realities cannot be grasped in the form of universally valid truths. Rudolf Bultmann, the existentialist, asked him, therefore, to stop being so voluble about the supernatural trinity, miracles, and much else. If Bultmann stole many of Bart's sheep, it was because Bart had given them insecure lodgings in the fold of neo-orthodoxy. My central point is that liberal arts learning in America was in the main even less interested in neo-orthodoxy than it had earlier been in modernism. Both postulations had fatal flaws, not least of all, an epistemic inconsistency that clouded the essence of the biblical heritage they both professed to maintain. It was neither Fosdick's theology nor Barth's theology, but rather secular humanism that comprised the covert conceptuality of the modern universities in the West. The emerging metaphysics of contemporary academe was no longer confidently theistic. Instead, ultimate reality was now seen as totally reducible to impersonal processes. All existence and life as time bound and bearing an expiration date. All philosophical premises, all theological tenets, all ethical imperatives as historically relative and culturally conditioned. Nature and history as not inherently patterned, but gaining their sense from the empirically revisable projections of academicians. All these control beliefs came now to govern the modern age on its intellectual side. About this academic mindset, at least two things must now be said. One is that popular opinion polls repeatedly show that despite their favored place in the culture, secular humanists have generally been far less determinative of public opinion than one might believe. The other is that secular humanism, unable to sustain the elements of humanitarianism that distinguish it from blatant naturalism, is declining toward cultural nightfall and end time. The century that began with unbridled optimism, rising from flawed assumptions of the essential goodness of man and the inevitability of progress is now ending with an anti-theistic gridlock on the influential cultural centers. Yet no verdict uttered by academia in the generation now concluding was as misguided as the eschatological prediction of Harvey Cox, who spoke at Harvard of a society moving toward a religionless future in the context of a radically secular city. While a rising neo-pagan tide is today surely hostile to the supernatural and distances itself, especially from Christianity, 
it is nonetheless pervasively religious. What neo-paganism does not accommodate, however, is what was critically important for the early church, namely a distinction between true and false religion. If the empirical method was the modernist criterion, the evangelical rallying cry was the inspired and authoritative Bible, especially its New Testament consummation in Jesus Christ. The fundamentalist fivefold test, so-called, exhibited modernism's essential departure from Christianity's major creedal commitments. In the view of the modernist controlled Federal Council of Churches, later the National Council, Christianity's greatest embarrassment lay in the divided condition of its churches. This plight the Council hoped to solve by its realization of one world church. For evangelicals, on the other hand, nothing less was at stake than the survival of true religion itself. To prize church unity above doctrinal fidelity was in principle to undermine the church. Evangelical frustration ran deep. It was not limited to the fact that ecumenical leaders had captured traditional Christian institutions and churches for a modernist restatement of Christianity. It was specially provoked by the fact that the Federal Council was excluding evangelicals from a proportionate share of free public service radio time, and moreover, opposed even the sale of commercial religious time to evangelicals. It was this evident hostility by one world church ecumenism toward the evangelical message that spurred evangelicals to appeal to the Federal Communications Commission at hastily projected annual sessions of national religious broadcasters. Organized in 1942, the National Association of Evangelicals provided its American constituency an alternative framework of cooperation to that of the Federal Council. From its beginnings, the NAE included Pentecostals, thus encouraging a diversity of evangelical identification within its main emphasis on the infallibility of Scripture. Soon its commissions claimed to reflect the spiritual concerns of 10 million or more affiliates. The Billy Graham tent meetings in Los Angeles marked another breakthrough that of secular media coverage. Ecumenical criticism of evangelical evangelism as an enterprise indifferent to socio-political concerns was now outflanked by the secular press's growing coverage of the Crusades as a response to people's hunger for a personal relationship with God. This factor ecumenical preoccupation with social affairs had widely ignored. By appealing to evangelical remnants in the ecumenically associated denominations, Graham carried fundamentalist evangelism into the very ecumenical movement whose leaders deplored it. Also in 1947, appeared my small book, The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism, often mentioned as an influence in turning evangelicals from social withdrawal to cultural engagement. More than 30 years later, Jerry Falwell would give this appeal a more specific orientation when he organized Moral Majority to promote legislation that would restore America to her presumed initial Christian foundations. Moral majority failed to achieve significant legislative objectives, however. Observers viewed it more as confrontation 
than as a quest for democratic consensus. It nonetheless placed moral concerns of special importance to the religious community permanently on the public agenda. To some extent, the evangelical left has also latched on to the cause of evangelical cultural involvement. The danger in all appeals for cultural involvement is that evangelicals may be lured into thinking that political action is the sure way to transform society. Today, evangelical Christianity recognizes, and fortunately so, the legitimacy and necessity of both evangelism and social concern, even if it may not as yet have coordinated them in a universally acceptable way. Also in 1947 occurred the formation of Fuller Theological Seminary, the first interdenominational seminary west of the Mississippi, whose goal of producing a comprehensive evangelical literature predicated on the inerrant authority of scripture has been largely taken up by Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. While evangelicals subsequently missed the opportunity in the 1960s of establishing a great metropolitan Christian university in the New York City area, they did implement a growing consortium and coalition of Christian colleges. Yet only few of such schools any longer promote the Christian world life view on a curriculum-wide basis, and some others do not significantly emphasize the truthfulness of scripture as an institutional commitment. Today's competition for students by both seminaries and colleges often yields campuses of diverse doctrinal and denominational emphases where such differences are accommodated as enriching rather than perhaps problem-laden. The burgeoning enrollments in evangelical schools seems now to have leveled, however. And the next decade may see educational mergers in the interest not only of fiscal survival, but also of academic soundness. Hundreds of qualified evangelical scholars now hold earned doctorates from even the most prestigious academic centers. Many tenured faculty on both Christian and secular campuses are facing rather early retirement. Alongside an emphasis today on academic diversity and a growing public interest in traditional values, we can perhaps expect a more genuine pluralism that welcomes competent evangelicals as faculty applicants. The formation in 1956 of the magazine Christianity Today provided evangelicals with a thought journal that linked conservative scholars worldwide, whatever their denominations, in an aggressive theological witness to evangelical essentials. It also stimulated the literary quality of evangelical publications generally and nurtured the growth of evangelical publishing houses. Competent evangelical literature did not, therefore, as in earlier years, need to compete with the theological hostilities of routine book editors. Today, evangelical literature frequently appears under the label of the great university presses. By 1976, evangelicalism in America gained a measure of public attention that the previous generation would have considered almost unthinkable. When the National Association of Evangelicals was formed in 1942, modernism had so discredited the term evangelical among the intellectual elite that only those unconcerned about being cataloged as fundamentalists by the champions of modernity were inclined to welcome and to use the term. But by 1976, Newsweek could title one of its cover stories, The Year of the Evangelical. It acknowledged that America's 50 million religious conservatives 
comprise the nation's fastest growing spiritual force. Evangelical vitalities had reached into every arena of modern life. There were the Christian Medical Society, American Scientific Affiliation, Evangelical Theological Society, Christian Legal Society, and significant national student groups, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, Navigators, Young Life, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and so on. Whatever mistakes were made, and there were many, whatever opportunities had been missed, and these two were many, evangelical Christians had carried to the nation the sure confidence that all biblical realities remain in place that God's promises have not been nullified, and that the life-transforming dynamic of the gospel of Christ is as powerful as ever. That same year of the evangelical, Charles Colson, whose lust for political power in the Watergate era propelled him and others to federal prison, emerged from his sentence into the truly real world. In that real world of sinners in universal need of grace, Colson founded Prison Fellowship Ministries, the largest global humanitarian agency to appear since the time of Bob Pierce, who, as an evangelical war correspondent in China, had in the 1950s launched World Vision to proclaim the gospel and to minister to orphans in Korea. To a world fleeing from God, and his transforming grace. Evangelical Christianity may appear, but a futile effort to restore a long eclipsed past to an age that doubts the intellectual credibility of the gospel, or to focus on personal religion at the cost of social concerns. Contemporary church history bears its own witness, however. Whereas what passes for modernity soon calls for post-modernity, the truths of the Bible remain an unrivaled and abiding stimulus for constructive cultural engagement and for a personal walk with God. 